All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for for the posts that were brought down. We thought you might enjoy them. Um, and so without further ado, let us uh, let us roll that beautiful... Oh, wait, they're going to sue me. Play it. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is a place, and nerds run the world. And without further ado... All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Today, as our special guest, we have the one, the only, Topher, Mr. Christopher (laughs) Hopper. Oh, man, I can't escape it. (laughs) I have too many Chris's floating around today. I don't know how I'm going to keep it straight. So, uh, welcome to the show, Christopher. It's great to be here. So, all right. Well, normally we have the the cheering gallery from Mr. Winder over there in the back, but I I understand that uh, they had a sale today on Red Crowns and (laughs) he couldn't resist. And it is his dinner time, so forgive him, people. So let me (laughs) come up with better jokes. (laughs) (laughs) I got to come up with better jokes. I know. I'll do better next time, I promise. So, uh, Christopher Hopper is an American novelist known for his Ruins of the Galaxy and Resonant Sun series, co authored with co authored with best selling author J. N. Cheney. Christopher's other series include The Sky Riders, which is steampunk, The White Lion Chronicles, which is fantasy, and The Baron Fell Prophecies, a YA contemporary fantasy, which he co wrote with award winning author Wayne Thomas Batson. He lives with his wife and four children in the Thousand Islands of Northern New York. He loves flying F. PV race wings and RC planes with his boys and writing and performing music with his girls. Uh, for more information about Chris, his links will be in the uh, show notes below as usual. But can you tell me real quick, what is FPV yeah, race wings? Super fun. They are picture a 1940s Delta wing, but made out of EPP foam and it's remote controlled. You put a camera on the front, you wear goggles over your head and oh, you son of a gun. 130 miles an hour through race courses, pylons, gates, and you compete against other pilots. It's it's a rush. Are, are they little or are they cool. big? They're they're um, they range anywhere on the low end in the you know 28 inch range and can get all the way up. I've seen guys. There's one guy out in California, um, Ruben Haddock, who, who builds these things. Are like 12 feet wide. So. Yeah, they can, they can be big. But typically what we fly are between 28 and 36 inches. That sounds like so much fun. I've, I've seen drone racing, but this is like – this is serious. Yeah, yeah. And I used you to race these suckers. It's going to hurt. <laughs> yeah, I used to race drones, but they're pretty expensive to maintain. And my wife was like, yeah, you're going to find a new hobby. So <laughs> this is so like the cheaper version. <laughs> so what kind of RC plane do you fly? Uh, we have a whole collection. We fly seaplanes, we fly biplanes, uh, EDF jets. Um, wow! So the game, okay. Great things. Yeah. All right. So the second part, dear listener, is how we found them. So uh, Hopper and I are in some of the same writing groups. So when he started writing, I encouraged him to dive in. Uh, I didn't know that he had other secret projects out in the world because he didn't tell me the meanie, uh, but he was nice enough to send me some pretty cool swag when he finally got this uh, first book out there. Uh, it was clearly bribery and it worked because here he is. But uh, what about you? Did he bribe you as well, Mr. Winder? Uh, he bribed me just to come on the show today. <laughs> <laughs> that bottle of scotch is in the mail, Chris. So. All right. Yep, I'll try not to drink it all in one night because I may never come back. <laughs> all right. Actually, I don't remember how we met. Um, I think I think we're just mutual acquaintances online because we have all similar friends. You know, th- so. th- that's where I meet all my friends anyways. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right, good to go. Well, the next question is yours, Mr. Winder. All right, so the religion question, and unfortunately I don't have the kick button today. JR does. 
But it's the uh, religion question, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Oh, I'm going to go with Star Wars just because it was the first. It was my first date. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's always a special place in the in your heart for the first one, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think uh, Jeff Cheney just posted a cat meme, and the cat is, like, watching somebody raise cat food up in the air, and the caption says, me watching the yellow letters on every Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's me. So... Love me some Star Trek, love me some Firefly, but Star Wars for the All right, we're going to get a little controversial now. How do you feel about the last three movies for Star Wars? Ooh, I I asked that later, but okay. Ask it now. Ask it now. (laughs) You want to ask it? We can save it. We can save it. Go for it. It's it's out there in the air now. All right. Let's do this. Um, I'm, I'm so torn. Uh, on one hand, I'm thrilled that my children have a similar experience and watching my daughter dress up as Ray for Halloween was very, very cool. Seeing those three little, you know, buns in her hair. And I'm like, wow, my daughter has a hero. Um, however, for me, I just felt like it strayed too far from some of the ethos. And, um, so it's like, I rejoice that my kids are happy, but secretly I go back in my room at late at night and watch Episodes four, five, and six. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just to feel better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So what do you love about science fiction as a genre? Oh, I love that it forces readers to dream about the impossible as if it were possible. Hmm. Um, there's something very magical about that. I go back to listening to Ray Bradbury and um, – you know, hearing my, my family read Bradbury stories to me, I, it was just like I was transported to somewhere else outside of my norm where technology was not a hurdle, but an asset. Um, and I just, I just love that. I love that pull forward into the future, uh, to the impossible dream, so to speak. So good answer. Yeah. Good answer. Thanks. Hmm. So is, is Star Wars your very first memory of anything sci-fi, or was there something before that? Um, yeah, I would say I, th- I would say Star Wars was the first one. Right on the heels of it would have been uh, Dune. Um, oh yeah, and honestly, some th- some of the weird like side movies that maybe not a lot of people are familiar with, but things like The Last Starfighter. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Ooh, good one. Uh, which, by the way, it's so funny to me that my kids can watch like Pirates of the Caribbean today, which I think is fairly graphic, especially for some of the younger ones. But they love it. But then they watched Last Starfighter with me, and there's this one scene where this this like um, this droid comes, takes on the personality of a human, but in their metamorphic phase. He's like down in the in the lower bunk. I don't remember that scene. And the cover you get, get pulled back, and you just see this like white gelatin larva face pulsing. All four of my kids <laughs> run out of the living room crying when they see that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like 1983 technology special effects, and you're freaking out. I just I don't know. There's something about those old movies, man. <laughs> It's because it's the acting was better. <laughs> well, it's it's because the acting was better because they didn't rely on special effects. Oh. Yeah. Let's go with that. So the drama and the tension was there. So did you hear they're going to be supposedly making a Last Starfighter oh, sequel? I, di- I didn't, but I'm going to see it. I don't care what anybody says. Aren't, aren't they going to have to rename the so first looks- one the next to the Last Starfighter then? <laughs> Well, so at the end of the last Starfighter, spoiler alert, they end with him victorious and starting, you know, rebuilding the the space, you know, yeah. armada. And so the theory is that the, the fan theory is if they're going to take a sequel because we don't know, they just know we know they have the original uh, writers involved. Ooh. But if they were going to do it, that they would take it forward once he's rebuilt his army, so they can get that same actor or someone who looks reasonably close to do the. Uh, now he's an old man leading the younger ones, and you can sort of pass the baton. But you're doing it in a way that doesn't. Uh-huh. violate canon they're going to run the same thing if they ever tried to read sure, firefly or write a sequel because because the actor's aged right mm-hmm. and so but this would do it a way where they sort of pass the baton and take the story forward all, so all I but know, you know we've been promised a yeah, lot all, all i want is is Catherine mary stewart in there she was maggie and 
Oh, yeah. Yes. I, as long as she makes a cameo, I am very happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we go down nostalgia lane, because we do have a tight timeline, because uh, Winder will die without his daily injection of crown syrup straight into a bloodstream. Uh, Winder, let's move this forward. I don't think you can inject crowns, can you? Yeah. If you heat it, right? Isn't that what you do, right? Cr- you know, with the meth addict, you're in gold there with your crown. And you stick them on your head. And, huh. Last time, <laughs> them didn't do so well. So I'd say. There's a reason I was in the army. I'm not a crown addict. <laughs> All right. So, so how'd you go from from enjoying science fiction to actually writing in it? Did you start somewhere else and then and then suddenly see the light and come to the light side and start uh, writing sci-fi? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, because science fiction in my youth was so sacred. Even though I started writing novels in 2005, I did not feel. This is going to sound kind of weird, but I didn't feel worthy. And it, okay. it, it yeah. was almost like I was going to mess with my childhood and I didn't feel competent enough to do that. So I stayed in other genres that I liked. I grew up reading Tolkien and, and the Hobbit and um, C.S. Lewis. So fantasy seemed like a natural fit. And so my first trilogy was a fantasy uh, trilogy, then dabbled in some YA contemporary fantasy uh, then got into steampunk, and all the while, some of my very closest friends were like, "Christopher, you need to write science fiction. Like, you love science fiction. Why didn't you write in it?" I just put it off and put it off. Um, <laughs> it was last year. I was on sabbatical, and I had all this free time, and I started listening to um, just researching all these authors that I loved but didn't know anything about. And I heard an interview with Jason Anspach and, and Nick Cole. Um, and that interview changed my life. It was on Keystroke Medium, uh, the writer's journey. Yeah. And um, it changed my life. And I realized after devouring their stuff, I'm like, I can do this. Like, they're playing with the sacred and having a ball. If, and If these hacks can do it, anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, if you're listening, that's basically what I thought. So. <laughs> Sorry, boss man. <laughs> what's crazy, what's really crazy is fast forward now a year – And both of those guys, I consider friends, at least digital friends, we'll say. Yeah. And never, ever thought that I would be on an interview like this talking about stuff um, because I decided, you know what? I'm going to mess with my childhood. Let's bring it on. Ah, well, nice. And knowing is half the battle. I get (laughs) it. That's right. (laughs) The all-American hero. (laughs) So do you have an author or a movie that's been the biggest influence on your writings or – like me, have someone you're uh, you're trying to outright or outdo? Oh my gosh! Um, there have been yeah, I mean, there's been so many so many influences. Um, I'd say the recent ones, like guys like Jim Butcher. Um, even though he's not sci-fi, I still think he's uh, just a fantastic writer. Um, obviously, obviously, those two guys I mentioned earlier, those hacks, um, they inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just, you know, I enjoy, it's so fun. I enjoy being able to direct message these guys, like a Chris Fox or yeah. Richard Fox, Jay Allen. And like, holy crap, you guys are the legends. And thanks for writing me back. <laughs> yeah, there's still people. That's that's yeah. the part I, I, I didn't expect when I started writing either. It is, uh, they're, they're not jerks. They're not, uh, gosh. Yeah, they're 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 just regular people. They're they're cool. Yep, I will say real quick uh, an addendum to that question. I do try, and this is yeah, I won't qualify. It is what it is. I try to outright myself. Okay, and I, I'm trying to always. Um, I appreciate what Jeff Cheney says. He's like, you never have a summit. If you have a summit, your career is dead. You're always trying to get better, and I love that hunger and that sense of I want to learn more. So. Not only will I be reading a book on how to be a better writer, but I'm writing, I'm reading things that um, are provoking me and to to learn every day something new about the craft. Yeah. That just excites me. I just love it. All right. So transitioning away from the writing side, let's talk about things from a fan angle. Have you gotten any cool fan art or had a fan cosplayer one of your characters yet? Oh, fun question. Uh, I haven't had cosplay on a character. I'm, I'm really hoping for that. 
not going to lie. Uh, I have had some great fan art, though, uh, especially when I first started writing Runes of the Galaxy. This is before I pitched it to Jeff or anyone. Um, I developed about 100 readers on a private Facebook group, and a few of them were artists. And one of them like got super into the chapters I was sending out, because I'd send out like three chapters a week for them to respond to. And the next- Oh, nice. Was, yeah, it was, it, it was a great process, really helped me with- whether or not, honestly, can I write in sci-fi? It was those hundred people that told me, yes, you can. And I'm, I'm endeared to them forever. They're listed in the back of the first book. Um, but one of them, a guy named Caleb Baker started sending me some stuff and he like, he drew the MAR 30, which is one of the assault rifles. He drew the, uh, the, what's called the, the Z. Um, it's a pistol. There's a, a combat knife. And then he starts sending me pictures of one of the main protagonists. And I'm like, this is, this is really <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I still have those. They're treasured possessions from him. So, yeah, a lot of fun. Nice. So has anyone ever asked you for your autograph out in public away from regular book signing events? Yes. Yes. Um, oh, tell us that's, about it. <laughs> it's kind of a surreal thing. Um, actually, I had something happen last night where, fortunately, they didn't ask for my autograph, but I walked into uh, a local pub here. Um, with one of my buddies and the hostess stared at me and pointed at me. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, this is awkward. She goes, you're, you're him. <laughs> I said, well, I, I could be, need, need to be a little more specific. And we had a great conversation and, and she's uh, been a fan of the work. So that was, that was fun. I think she, she didn't want to ask for the autograph cause she might get fired, but we had a great conversation and we tipped her. Oh, around. that's great. <laughs> so, so now you got to go back there and give her some some sweet swag yeah I, where's, where was the poker chip jr right i don't know so he's got some some pretty cool poker chips as swag because he gave them to uh to all the people that helped him in the beginning he sent them out like his care packages with like a t-shirt and a poker chip so i asked him in the pre-show what the poker chip was for because i never got to find out and if it said it on the poker chip i don't know because my kids thought it was cool and sort of claimed it yeah happens sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, tell us about the poker chip real quick. Well, the poker yeah. chip um, kind of comes from my marketing background, which I have a fairly extensive uh, expertise in that. And so you're always trying to think outside the box and and how do you make the, the most impact, the least amount of money and still be memorable and not chintzy. One of my characters, um, whose name is Abimbola, he is like a warlord and he's super big dude, like Ugandan warrior guy he always carries around this poker chip and he flips it kind of like a two-face to determine people's fates or what they're going to do and uh, i got thinking man i really want to go to this conference uh in november in vegas that everybody talks about and says i should be at and wouldn't it be fun instead of handing out business cards to hand out poker chips that are branded in the series and right because it's vegas because it's vegas oh that's great yeah and so i just i made i made a hundred and now i made a second hundred and i'm going to be printing another run here soon um so yeah i send them out to people that that i just appreciate their feedback um or i'll you know i always keep one in my pocket and and pass them out if i see somebody wearing a you know a star wars shirt or Battlestar galactica fandom or whatever and just hey here's a chip and And everybody looks at it and goes, dang, what is this? I'm like, yeah, you're going to have to find out. Leave them hanging. (laughs) Wow, that's great. That's a great idea. Thanks. Thanks. Huh. So have have you ever spotted someone uh, in the wild reading one of your books? Uh, Yeah, several times, actually. Um, Wow. And I've I've had some – I was talking to JR off off air about this a little bit. Because of those first several series, which – uh, were all traditionally published. Um, probably one of the craziest things is to s- obviously see your book on a shelf in a store, which I might need to explain to your listeners what bookstores uh, were. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, one of the coolest things uh, happened to me at my local borders um, before it closed. Uh, th- somebody was in an aisle and I knew it was the, I knew it was the fantasy fiction aisle and I just happened to see my cover and they're holding the book. And I just kind of walked up and stood next to them and just started casually talking about the book. Uh, they had no clue. And we had a great little dialogue <laughs> and I just walked away. 
And then all of a sudden I turned back around and they had flipped the book over, saw the author photo, looked at me and their jaw dropped. And I just waited. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm That's- not normally this cool in real life, but that moment, man, that felt good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All it's right. Great. So then your kids come to you and say, Dad, you're a real jerk. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I get that. So, um, so now this is the part where we list out the various series that Christopher Hopper has written. So we have the Ruins of the Galaxy series with Jay and Cheney, The Resonant Sun. Uh, what's the name of that series? Because book two is not out yet. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we're kind of running with the first title because everybody knows it, Resonant Sun series, but you, we're, we're kind of even calling it just the Resonant series because Resonant Abyss is book two. Uh, Resonant something is book three. I can't, remember. I can't remember. But that's the key word is Resonant. So The Resonant series works. I like sagas. Nobody uses that Ooh, word anymore, but word. sagas. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. Or Chronicles. Just don't, like, just don't know? do Ooh, yeah. Annals. Because – I don't, <laughs> nobody nobody pronounces that the way it's intended. Yeah. <laughs> I'll check like eight times. Like the what annals? Annals? I ah. walk away. <laughs> All right. So so we're gonna walk away from that one before our wives get mad at us. Uh, we have the Baronfell Prophecy series, the White Lion Chronicles, and the Sky Riders. This book looks like it might be a series, but I can't tell. So is there any plans? That's the steampunk one. Is there any plans to write a, a follow up? Yeah, that? I have a lot of people pretty upset with me. So don't read that unless you are willing to wait another year. But the sequel is coming. Um, and I'm actually really excited to write it. Um, but I have a few more books ahead of it that need to get done. So so is that going to be back with the uh, Trad Pub or are you going to self-publish? It's self pub. Yeah. The, honestly, the only thing I think I'd ever Trad Pub again is um, is nonfiction. Um, hmm. I, I have several books kind of in the works right now, and those are for very specific audiences. But, man, Amazon's just made it really easy to make money. Um, hmm. And Trad Pub has made it more difficult. So – I appreciate the opportunities they gave me and I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, but I would not be going to back to drink from that. Well, I'll just say that. Very diplomatic. Yes. So I've looked at all of your books and they sound amazing, but today we're going to uh, focus on the ruins of the galaxy series, specifically book one of the same name. So how did you come up with the idea or premise for this uh, series that you Uh, worked on with Jay and Chaney. Where did the spark of inspiration come from? Um, So I'm going to totally just brag on Galaxy's Edge. Um, I loved listening to Galaxy's Edge, loved listening to R.C. Bray. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that's what kind of got me going, hey, I think I can do this. Um, But also noticed some things where Galaxy's Edge went a little more hard mill sci-fi um, and Rah. yeah, and tended to not go as heavy into space opera. I just recognized my strength is not mill sci-fi because honestly, I haven't served in the military. However, uh, I am a history buff and I've spent the last 15 years working with the soldiers and families of Fort Drum, United States Army here in Northern New York. And so because of that proximity, I have access to incredible servicemen and women, incredible veterans. And so a lot of that has rubbed off. So so it's one of those things where I'm going, okay, I don't feel confident enough to say, hey, all you guys who actually served, this is going to be up your alley. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not going to be maybe um, soft enough, and that sounds like a bad word, but uh, I'm not going to be as palatable for maybe true space opera people because I do like, I do like weapons and I do like going into some detail and I do like following military tactics and I do like comms discipline and I do like strategy. So, so trying to find this balance um, of, Hey, I'm not going to be as hard mill as, as maybe galaxy's edge. And I know they're not even as hard mill as some can be. Um, but conversely, uh, I do love, I do love space opera. Uh, I love the rich character development and I want to stay faithful to that as best I can. So I'm a little further over than galaxy's edge, but they're really the guys that were like, you know, kind of without knowing it inspired me to do this and make a leap. So, yeah. So 
Uh, we're going to pause for a moment with the podcast, and I'm going to pick up my um, unlicensed therapist hat, and I'm going to ask you this quick question. So are you familiar with this little hack? His name is um, Clancy. You might have heard of him. He, he sometimes told stories. Yeah, I mean, once in a while, you know, I've, I've heard his name. Really so, so Clancy might have been known for his military thrillers, but I'm going to let you in a little bit of a secret. Please he do. never served in the military. You know what he did serve in? What? The U.S. library system, as in he had a library card so he could learn things. <laughs> People don't expect you to have served in the military if you tell good stories. It certainly helps and when someone didn't and they get the culture wrong, they'll say something. Yeah, But that's not a requirement. The military readers aren't looking for it. You don't have to worry about that. Thank you. So you have you have the Winders uh, Marine Corps seal of approval, and you can have J.R. Hanley's U.S. Army seal of approval. Go forth and tell your military stories. <laughs> I love you guys. You're freaking awesome. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So now that the uh, therapy session is over, the bill's in the mail. And uh, before we dig in, can we just take a moment and say that uh, normally as a colorblind person, the covers don't always speak to me, but I think your cover is amazing. Uh, I, I've seen the old cover before you signed with uh, Variant Publishing, uh, which is amazing as well. Um, so what do you look for when you're picking covers since you, you managed to nail two awesome ones? Oh. Uh, what do you think makes a good uh, fit for the subgenre? Thank you. Well, first of all, big shout out to Matt Flint, who did the original artwork for the first three uh, original publications. Um, he was great to work with, highly recommend him, and love his art. He does everything by hand from the ground up. Very talented guy. Um, so I, I, going back to the, the, the space opera side, I really want to connect with characters. Um, and I think Matt has a strength there. Um, and the present cover you'll see has, has that strong protagonist, but moves the ball forward into the, the higher end sci-fi realm. And so to really feel like, man, I've been pulled forward into this gritty, futuristic, vibrant world that just goes, man, I want to, I want to go meet that guy. And I also think I need to duck so I don't get shot. <laughs> That's <what Yeah>. I- <laughs> Okay. So yeah, not getting shot's a good thing. Yeah. Sucks people. So when I read the blurb, there's a obvious comparison that jumped out at me. This has a slight Star Wars vibe, but a little bit grittier. So was I way off or was the uh, similarity intentional? No, it's – yeah, you got it. It's There's there's some good similarities there. Again, goes back to the religion question. Star Wars is my – you know, can, can I say popped my cherry? Is that is that wrong? Um, was my – I mean, I won't tell if you won't tell. <laughs> what does that mean? Secret. I have no idea. <laughs> me either so yeah that's my that's my go-to and so i i think it's just again a a lot of people have said that it's grittier star wars um and i think some of that just comes because of life and i'm not writing for uh as some might even suggest a pg audience or pg-13 audience because we're talking about real life issues and what people go through and i think books no matter what genre they're in have the ability to speak to life as it could be and to shape our understanding um, and how we relate to pain and trial. So uh, I think sci-fi is a a great vehicle for those themes. Okay. So um, we just got dear, didn't we? Sorry. We did. We did. And that's okay. And I'm trying to, to haul it back because, I mean, I, I'm still on the uh, – I'm a history nerd because you know, last person that told me that we had an hour detour and Chris was like, yeah, you, you can't do that again. I'm going to quit. <laughs> so I'm trying to be good because he, 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 he was mean to me. Hurt my feeling. And I only have one left. So on that note, while I recover my manhood, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man. Twenty years have passed since the Ixa almost wiped humanity from the face of the galaxy. Now they have returned with a prophecy of doom. And the prophecy is already coming true. Start the series readers are calling an action-packed military thrill ride. Download Super Carrier today, book one in the Ixan Prophecies trilogy, available from Amazon and Audible. All right. Welcome back from that commercial interlude. Thank you for sticking with it as our shenanigans got the best of us. But uh, we are still back with Christopher Hopper, author of the Ruins of the Galaxy series, the uh, Star Wars, but grittier. So, uh, Winder, the next question is yours, sir. 
So, Ruins of the Galaxy, uh, it's also, the premise kind of sounds like a less cheeky version of Firefly. Was that intentional? I mean, is Firefly, is Firefly ever not intentional? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean. <laughs> it's, Maybe for the two people in the world who haven't seen it yet. You, there it is. And if they haven't, shame on them. Shame on them, right? And shame, shame on their friends, shame. too. Because they, you know, they should share. Forsooth. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that one came from. Sorry, guys. That was free. That was a good uh, one. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's that certain sense of, um, you, you get weird being trapped in a airtight little pod hurtling through the abyss, um, and stuff happening, you know, put enough people in a tight space in the middle of nowhere and. I don't know. You say stupid stuff and share things you wish you hadn't. And so <laughs> I'll be in my bunk. Yeah. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but yeah, there's some firefly in there. There's, I've had a lot of comparisons to that as well. I don't think it was firefly as, as Jeff Cheney though. Renegade really has that feel to me. Um, that whole adventure quest seeking, you know, hold on, here we go. Kind of a feel. So mm. anyway, has anyone ever compared him to the uh, the donks from Galaxy's Edge? So the Jujari uh, are my race that are similar to the Xi in certain aspects. Um, they, they have some similar qualities, but again, diverge in their own particular way. Um, and unlike donkeys, these are, again, more back to a Jim Butcher creation. He had these these beasties called the, the Canim. Um who are like kind of like these giant wolves. And I just, uh, Kate Redding did the, did the narration for audible on that. And she has this great sound for them that I just hear my Jujari sounding like it's, you know, she always clenches her teeth and sneers kind of like, yes, but what about that person that we need to kill? Nice. And I'm like, (laughs) dang, I want to do that. So, <laughs> so if this writing thing doesn't take off, you've got a side career in uh, book narration, <laughs> right? So, I'm digging it. I've been told. <laughs> Although I will say, given that book one is currently, no, as we record on the uh, 22nd of August, it's number five in marine space, uh, space marine science fiction, number one in humorous science fiction, and number four in galactic empire science fiction. So I'm guessing we lost you to the world of audio narration, and it's a uh, it's a lock on the writing thing for a while. <laughs> I, I agree. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Especially since we just signed nine books to Podium Publishing. So yep. I'm not in the running, unfortunately, for that voiceover artist chair. But I feel like I'm, I at least threw my hat in the ring, you know. <laughs> so uh, R.C. Bray can, can eat for another day. That's right. It's mighty nice of you. I, I, I try to be a, a generous man. <laughs> Outstanding. So now on to the story itself. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your main character or characters? What makes them unique in a crowded field of science fiction? Mm. Cool. So um, I have two main protagonists. One is Magnus and the other is Eowyn. And they represent two extreme ends of the, we'll, we'll call it the, the lethality scale. Uh, when and how much violence to use and in what scenario. So you have Magnus, who is a seasoned recon uh, Marine, uh, highly specialized and just just a cool guy. He's, he's cool under pressure um, and pretty much not, not in an irresponsible way, but we are going to shoot first mm. and then talk about what happened because I don't want to lose anyone uh, in my, in my fire team. Uh, then you have Awen, who her representation is of a, uh, of a Jedi sort. We'll say they're called the Luma and they're uh, a, a little more involved with the politics of, of the galaxy. And she despises Marines. She despises the Republic and thinks that the best way to build relationship in the galaxy is through dialogue. And these two protagonists are thrown together in a maelstrom of blaster rounds and explosions that force them to work together um, or not. (laughs) <laughs> in in what develops to be a much larger plot to save the galaxy. Wow, okay. All right. So, so a lot of um, 
authors as they're writing find that there are certain secondary characters that sort of are extremely memorable to them. So did you have any secondary characters in your story that spoke to you uh, that in ways maybe that surprised you or yeah, that you want to share with listeners? No, that's cool. It's a great question. There are several, but I think probably my favorite who is on one of the t-shirts that uh, Mr. JR there has, I think uh, is a, is a droid called TO 96. And he embodies, I think, a lot of the the, the tropes um, of an AI, of an Android, of a bot, uh, very C-3PO in certain aspects. Um, but he really has this compulsion to want to understand humans and fails miserably with their idioms. Uh, his comic relief is, is marvelous. Um in his application of, of colloquialisms, his complete lack of understanding of sarcasm. Um, he's just an endearing character. And I think a lot of people have connected with him uh, over, over the first two books. So since you write humor, because when I wrote – Weiner and I together wrote Vacuums, uh, The Vacuum Sucks Hard, which was more barracks humor. Uh, mine was, was raunchy barracks humor without a plot, and I knew I couldn't publish that without Amazon putting it into categories I couldn't advertise. <laughs> uh, take of that what you will. So Weiner came and cleaned it up, and, and together we released it. And I realized that my humor probably isn't as universal. But uh, when you were writing your humor, did you find like, oh man, this is funny. I got to go tell somebody. And like you wake your, woke up your wife or your kids or something and be like, guess what I just wrote? Uh-oh. Did you have any of those moments? Totally. Because here, here's the thing, JR. I, you are a funny individual spontaneously in conversation. I am not. Like I have to work very hard to be funny. But when I'm writing, my humor comes out more easily. Um, and there are moments where I will literally double over laughing. Uh, at a, a section I wrote. And there was one line in particular that I did, just what you said. Um, TO96, the bot in question here, I'm a little spoiler alert, so if you don't want to hear this one-liner, t- fast forward 60 seconds. He meets Magnus, who is, again, the recon Marine, for the first time, and there's this awkward pause, and all of a sudden, he holds up his forearm, TO96 does, because on it, he has a modified micro missile launcher on his forearm and he holds it up to Magnus and he just says, would you like to touch my missile? And it's just in the context of the book. It's one of those laugh out loud moments where I, people write me like I, I literally had to put the book down. I'm like, that's the end. But anyway, I told that to my wife and she just looked at me like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know she is not your target audience. So, you know, we asked this with the Dragon Con panel that you guys listened to about a month back, but, uh, you know, about humility as you're starting to do well. And I keep thinking about that, that uh, with the Roman emperors, when they would go on their, um, their little parade when they, when they, you know, hit the big time and they had a slave follow them and tell them that thou art mortal. I think for us writers, even mm-hmm. especially the most successful one, that role falls to their spouse. So yeah. like... Yeah. yeah, but you still didn't wash the dishes. So uh, let's go handle that, you know? Literally, <laughs> yeah. literally today, I'm not kidding you. I'm driving with my wife and she goes, babe, I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh, crap. She goes, I just got back from this retreat for her, for her job. And she said, and I came home and there were dishes in the sink. And I think it was a responsibility, <laughs> wasn't it? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm not the only one. Good, we can start a support group. But uh, finally, does your story have any bad guys uh, for the main characters confront, or is it more just the universe itself is the bad guy? So, so without spoilers, obviously, tell us about the uh, the baddies. There is a particular admiral who suffers what everybody thinks is a nervous breakdown, but it's way worse than that. There is also the head of a, an undisclosed peacekeeping organization whose lust for peace, believe it or not, causes him to do some pretty horrible things. Um, mm. And then there's another, but I'll leave that one for the readers to discover. It's too So, yeah. Okay, so Rune to the Galaxy is clearly part of the series, I know, because it says so on the title. Uh, there are currently two books out in the series with more mentioned on your website. Will there be more from these characters? Where do you see it going? Can you say without a spoiler? Yeah, sure. Um, so right now, Jeff and I 
have the series mapped out to about nine books, believe it or not. Um, I'm very excited to wow. write. Yeah, to write more. Uh, book four has been outlined, and we'll begin work on that in a week and a half. And uh, and then we'll see where it goes. I, I, you know, I've heard several people who I admire and respect be like, "Man, fifteen was way too many." So, so I'm trying to pace it. And Jeff is a great coach, and we work very, very well together. Um, I think there might be some spinoffs coming from it as well. Again, this Ooh, is nice. dependent upon the readership saying, "Hey, we love this. Keep going." As long as people are willing to read it and buy it, come on, you know the drill. It's like, yep, we'll keep re- we'll keep writing it. Yep, yep. Okay, so does your universe have? Uh, oh, what kind of technology can we expect? Since it's a sci-fi, are there ray guns, faster than light travel, teleporters, uh, machines that make uh, frozen ice cream, unlike mm-hmm. McDonald's machines? Yeah, I was going to say our primary weapons shoot cheese balls really fast. Um, I think that's my (laughs) thing. uh, (laughs) Yeah, we have um, blasters are definitely – I didn't care. I'm just like, hey, I'm writing this for me, the first draft. And before it went to Jeff, I'm like, hey, this is where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to try to stay within the confines of of several different, you know, structures. I don't want to be too crazy because I am kind of a – I'm a physics nerd on the side and love – string theory and you know i nope. basically i i feel like i get to, to it is and really in ruins as well i got to research quantum mechanics and navy seals and put it all together that's what ruins this for me so. yeah but now you're on a list <laughs> oh no what's the list oh <laughs> uh, it's probably some government watch list because uh, you know you mix those two things you, you're definitely up to no good right totally. or writer i mean one of the two Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there's blasters in there. Um, there, I don't want to give it away. There's a major, there is a major physics element to this um, that, that had a lot of thought behind it, took a lot of research to make it plausible. And that's the biggest thing, you know, that whole, the suspension of disbelief. I really try to make sure things feel plausible, even if mm. they seem impossible, at least to go, yeah, but I, yeah, I could see that happening. Then I'm like, good, because the last thing we want to do is show the author's hand and just make yeah. it worse. Um, so try to be hyper aware of that. I think you uh, answered enough to give the readers or the readers, the listeners, an idea of what they can read. And uh, we can stop there then so you don't uh, go into spoiler territory, because obviously we want this to be a spoiler free interview. Thanks. <laughs> mm-hmm. Next question, Mr. Winder, before he gets himself in trouble and, and his publisher beats him up and then his wife beats him up and it goes downhill from there. <laughs> Well, it, it might be a spoiler as well. Okay. Are there aliens in your book? And if so, do you let nature inspire you or do you think them up whole cloth? Great question. Um, so there are aliens, yes. And I think that's safe to say that. Um, the Mostly humans play the key roles. However, there are there, – there, the race of the Jujari, which I mentioned to you earlier – um, ended up end up playing a, a fairly substantial role in the plot and and eventually the trajectory of the story. Um, and I, I like that because it, while I try very hard to make sure I'm just telling a great story that's fun and entertaining, um, and I don't I really don't like Trojan horses, meaning the author has some agenda to get you to think a certain way about a real life topic. I just want you to have fun. Yeah. Um, and I think that's my job as a storyteller. Now that said, I think it's impossible for any one of us to do that clinically and perfectly. Um, we're humans. And so we always want to convey our point of view, even if it's unintentional. Um, but one of the things I notice when dealing with aliens is it does allow us, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. C.S. Lewis said that fiction allows us to go around the back door of the mind and um, and avoid the dragons that we set up at the front gates. And I think that's really true. Yeah. So having an alien, I can talk about xenophobia. I can talk about the love or hate of the other and do it in a way that's not offensive because I'm talking about aliens and 
if you make a connection in your world and you feel personally challenged or convicted, that's on you. Man. <laughs> right. But I gave you the tools for your brain maybe to engage in something that you needed to address and perhaps were putting off. And I think those are the unintentional consequences of, of good fiction. Fair nice. enough. Right. Cause it's happening a million or billion or trillion miles away to things that uh, you can't mistake as human, but it's still hidden. Right. Nice. Yep. All right. So I've skimmed the reviews, as I always do. They help the right reader find the right books. So, dear listener, please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. The first book in this universe at at the time of recording has 42 reviews with a 4.7 star average rating. When I read through the only negative review, which I found, because they could be equally as helpful in proper book selection, I did see... Uh, one that I, I, on the surface, agree with. So full disclosure, I have not read this book yet. I've read parts of the book when he uh, sent me for advice on the military section, but I haven't read it in its totality. Um, although I did buy it. I've realized that, Winder, there's a difference between buying books and reading books. Yeah. Apparently, they're not always the same thing because I own way more than I've had time to read. Two but different anyway, hobbies. So, right, right. So, uh, <laughs> but they, they thought that the Space Marines in your book uh, spoke too politely and uh, cleanly, meaning they didn't think they cussed enough in the middle of a firefight. Uh, and having had experience huh. in firefights, I can tell you we, we cussed up a blue streak. But did that reaction surprise you to the fact that uh, they're saying you didn't put cuss words in there? Well, this is this is such a good topic. Um, it surprised me a little bit um, because I've had people. So my Marines do swear, probably not to the level that this particular reviewer would prefer, and I'll get into the reason why in a second. Um, but I know my Marines swear because I had people leave my Alpha readers group because they swore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, I think people tend to look for what they want and when they don't see it, they can almost have a visceral reaction to it. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so the the mechanics of this kind of came down the pipeline where I said, listen, I want, I want my children to be able to read this and think it's awesome. Uh, So there's a certain filter there. However, they are not my primary audience. My primary audience are, you know, 30 to 55 year old males of a particular North American leaning who like this stuff. And, um, and yet uh, I recognize I have a very wide reading audience. So I took a cue from galaxy's edge, <clears throat> which was inventing a few of my own words because I thought, Hey, I am fast forwarding in the future. I can do that using a couple contemporary uh, expletives that I find usable. And even to the point where one of my, my 10 year old sons said, Hey dad, the very first word of chapter 33 is a bad word. And I said, well, why do you think that is? He said, well, because Marines swear. I said, bingo. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, it's, it's been this very nuanced um, dialogue. I've had people on the other side, like, Hey, thank you for for writing a mill sci-fi book in which not everybody swore all the time. Um, (laughs) But the last thing I'll say is I had three wonderful men who helped me. Um, and JR, I would put you on that list as well because you did give some good early feedback. But three guys, um, one of which is a neighbor. He's a uh, former Green Beret. And I should say always Green Beret, but retired. And um, really helped me and tried to, to move through the dialogue in believable ways. Um, another guy, Walt Rob, Rob Allard, who who is – well known, I think, on the socials, um, would just go through and be like, "Dude, they'd never say that. They'd never in a room that way. Why did you have him talk that way to that guy?" You, so, anyway, th- there was, I think, mm-hmm. a comment like that. I tend to go, "Dude, be careful with how strong you word that because you don't know who you're actually critiquing when you think you're just critiquing two authors." I'll say it like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Um- I was going to ask this as a question, but I just – because it did amuse me. But you also had positive reviewers that loved that you had a story that wasn't overloaded with cussing. So it was like when you see yin and the yang, like a one star and a five star for the exact same thing, yeah. <laughs> it always sort of amuses me. It does. It does. <laughs> yep. 
Well, Winder and I had that with Breach Team because one thought that uh, the story was too short and the other thought it was too long. And we're scratching our heads like it was 90,000 words. I don't know how much longer you wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 90,000 in sci-fi. You guys are killing it. That's awesome. And I think that's it comes back to just write the book for you. And and that ultimately yeah. is what Ruins is. Um, and, and as I presented these to Jeff, I was like, Jeff, this is just me. Like I wrote these. I was writing through a midlife crisis, to be honest with you. And so I didn't care at this point. I was like, this is what I think is great. Maybe other people will like it too. He read it. He's like, dude, we're going to, we're going to put this out. And, um, and I, I think the 41 reviews are speaking for it as well as the sales. So, (laughs) yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a scary thing when you don't do the additions too often and the wives get mad. So I, I could see the midlife crisis, yeah. but uh, we're going to instead continue with the analysis of the reviews because I'm not licensed to psychoanalyze uh, and I don't want to upset people, but um, <laughs> let's move on to the positive reviews. I did see another common thread 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 in the reviews and they liked the fast paced action. So the, the fans thought you nailed it with the need to blend um, taking time to create a deeply rich and compelling universe with action and adventure story that was worth reading. So what was your trick for this? And how do you think you're going to manage it as you write your nine gazillion books and 27 spinoffs? Right. Great question. I have no clue. <clears throat> um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's easy. Lots of coffee. Um, I, I was a, a, a non-reader for most of my childhood. Um, I liked hearing stories uh, and I liked creative writing, but I hated reading books in school. I really didn't truly fall in love with reading until I was almost 20. And when I did, uh, I decided I made this before I even penned a book. I said, if I ever write a book, I want to do it for people like me who can't sit still. And therefore I tend to write. I, I just said in the last answer. Um, I, I wrote this book for me. I, I write every chapter for me. In other words, if I don't like it and it's not keeping my attention, then, um, then I'm doing something wrong. And so if people say they like the pace, all I can say is they're literally reading Jeff and me. Like this is, this is something that is gripping, keeps us moving forward, advance the plot, develop the character, and don't give them a second to breathe next chapter. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we wrap this up, are there any updates about other forms of media coming out? Uh, has it been optioned? Are you looking at role-playing games, movies, video games, uh, graphic novels, anything like that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I do have actually two uh, board games in development. Um, I'm a designer at the moment who is really interested in, in, in moving forward. So I've had, I've had a couple lunches over five guys uh, about that. Can't say any more at the moment, um, but uh, Resonant Sun is is looking really good for an Audible uh, deal coming up here, and um, so yeah, I think nine books in both of these series are at least what's slated, and some new stuff that's in development that I can't talk about. But needless to say, there's going to be books per month, a book per month for the foreseeable future. Let's just say that. Sweet. Okay, so is, is there anything about the Ruins of the Galaxy series or book one uh, that we didn't ask you want to tell us about before we go? Probably just a shout out and a thank you to all those who've read it. Um, I, I know it, it, it might sound just tried and true and, and maybe simple, but I, I just so appreciate the readers and would not be doing this without them. And so therefore, we write for them. And so thank you to all those who've read the books and and hold them dear. It means a lot more than you'll ever know. All right. So next uh, part of the introduction, yeah, introduction interview just glossed over like, all right, well, that was schmaltzy. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Winder has a tight timeline and I don't want him to turn into a pumpkin. And we have some fun questions to bring it up hey, man, at the end. We don't want to end them with them weeping into their, uh, their, their beer and, and whatnot about the woe is me life of a, of an author. And they already think we're all drunks all the time anyway, which isn't necessarily that far off. All but we want to, we want to give them the illusion that sometimes maybe we're sober while we sleep. I don't know what's going on. So, so we're trying to, trying to up the tempo right at the end. Keep going. 
All right. So you've set this story in the space marine subgenre of military science fiction, one near and dear to my heart. So what is your biggest pet peeve when you read books about futuristic warriors in this subgenre? Remember to speak generally, please, because karma is a thing. Yeah. I just hate when people say HUD uh, <laughs> for a head up display. I, it's just a HUD. I don't know. <laughs> yes, drives me batty. I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. That that's it. I, <laughs> I can dig it. <laughs> I'm just like so I, I'm not I'm not again, we know my service background. It's non existent. However, I do love acronyms and I think they're awesome and I even make fun of it in my books, but I just dude, just call it what it is, man, please, for the love of everything. <laughs> See, everyone says that they can't do the tactics, but if you've played sports or understand sports strategies, oh. most sports games historically evolved as a training method for warriors. There it is. Even golf. I, I know that to be a fact because I studied it in school, but I can't tell you for the life of me how that translates. But we don't have time for that thesis. Winder will kill me. <laughs> and I, I, I don't want him mad at me once we just signed a contract for two different series for books to write because then I'll be all on my own. So we're going to push this one forward. Uh, cause I can already hear him groaning. I'm going to have to mute him with my awesome admin powers tonight <laughs> and we're going to go forward. So following that, what about space Marines as they should be written? So who's your favorite? You've mentioned galaxy's edge, but is there anybody else? Um, you know, I really, um, I really enjoyed, uh, armor. Um, the, uh, Richard Fox's, um, I'm totally drawing a blank guys. Terran Armor Corps? Yep. I just – there was something really compelling. Again, it kind of mixed, you know, Mech Warriors, a little bit of the Matrix, and um, and just military strategy that I, I enjoyed that. I don't – it connected with me on a, a kind of a visceral level. So, uh, yeah. Read it. So – oh, go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna say, read it. If you haven't read it, whoever's out there. Yeah, it's it's some good stuff. So uh, more generally, so when you read the military science fiction subgenre, do you prefer the the space marines, the nitty gritty, you know, close up combat, or like the space space fleet with the ships duking it out at a distance? Do you I have a tend preference? To like boots on the ground. I do love starships, and you know, like some of Jay Allen's epic scope of wow, all these. Navy vessels everywhere. That's pretty cool. But but there's something about the band of brothers on the ground. I like it. Hmm. So. Okay. Ne- Next question is you, Mr. Winder. All right. I know so you're still so crying about that beer. Yeah. <laughs> you've also written in the colonization subgenre of science fiction. What's your biggest pet peeve when you read other books about planet shopping for new homes and far flung galaxies in this subgenre? That a planet only has one climate. Ooh, I like that. You're Aww. right. I like those. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm even saying that as someone who's broken that rule. Okay. So like the moon of Endor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just think you know, planets are so diverse that, uh, unless it, unless it's been nuked or a solar flare toasted it, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you're out as if I, I didn't say that's the only climate. That's just the only one we saw. But, you know, they could have been on the somewhere else that stuff was going like you could if you give yourself an out by not saying the whole planet was like that, they would just assume Thank that you. it's only where they were. Thank you. And I literally was writing something today in which I had a personal discussion with myself, internal monologue, uh, that was that very topic right there. there. So, yeah. All right. So following that, who writes colonization stories that you really like? Oh, man. So did you guys did you guys get into um, the Baba verse at all? Yes. Yeah. JR, I didn't hear you. You didn't get into it. No, I, I, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it yet. OK, I, I feel like um, Dennis did a fantastic job with that. Um, because the reality that humans actually get to colonize is very sci-fi y and he asserts that it's actually um, artificial intelligences and 3D printers that end up doing the majority of the work. And yeah. in such a believable way that I just thought, you know what, dude, you deserve to make all the money you're making because that was that was genius. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, normally we would uh, ask him about what he's reading, but he's plugged so many books already that we're just going to move forward. And uh, we know Winder doesn't actually know how to read Marines. So uh, he, he will sketch some pretty <laughs> sweet cave drawings on the walls. Um, and if I say what I'm reading, how are you skipping that question? Because you've listed so many books already. But I, you've, t- you've talked for 58 minutes about all the books you're already reading. <laughs> Alaron, and we've got some- Alaron Kong, The Land. There it is. <laughs> yeah, me too. His rebel self. All right. Alaron Kong, The Land. You, you just made more show notes. See, I'm trying to get out of the show notes. Uh, uh, and you and Winder, next he's going to be t- – no, I'm not going to say it because he's not going to say it. He's going to be nice. <laughs> so finally – um, I would normally tell you I just I'm reading Jay and Cheney's Renegade Star, but uh, I signed a con- or we're signing a contract with him, so that might sound like shameless plugging. So we're not going to do that, Winder. We're not going to mention we're reading his books. <laughs> right. um, so, so finally, we like to remember the science that makes science fiction fun. However, we are recording this uh, in advance enough that those uh, links that we listed would be too outdated. So instead, let's have a fun question. So, if you could colonize a planet in any sci-fi literary universe, what would you choose? and why and we'll start with you christopher oh i'm gonna go with arrakis on in the dune universe uh because i just think giant worms are freaking awesome and i want to ride one okay i mean there's the lack of water but sure we'll go with it yeah but you get what a, ice, bro true spice all right I, I see your point what about you winder what uh what planet uh in any life sci-fi literary universe would you colonize um, I don't remember the name of the planet, but Avatar. Ooh, that are you pro-human cool or pro-Avatar? Um, geez, kind of pro-human. I'm, I'm kind of evil like that. Ooh. Humanity first. <laughs> Death to the aliens. I'm with you. Well, mind that so. planet and then the rest of the planets. <laughs> if I can bring Sean Young from Dune over with you, I'm 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 good with that, too. All right. And so if I had to pick, I would say any planet in the uh, – that was habitable because sometimes they weren't. But any planet in the Stargate universe because the tech is super cool. Uh, and with the Stargates, you could always go home instantaneously. So E.T. can phone home. Wow. You have an out. I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will say I will push Winder through first just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've already finally – yeah, we, he says the same thing, so it's fair. All fair in love and war. Uh, one more question for the road. Uh, what universe would you not want to be part of a colonization team for, uh, Mr. Christopher? Um, you know what? Because I don't like athlete's foot, uh, I would not want to be on Dagobah, in the Dagobah system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Swamp rot. <laughs> What's that one? That's uh, Star Wars? Yeah. yeah. I thought so. All right. We'll go with that. What about you, Chris? Anywhere in the Aliens franchise. Oh, good call. Oh, that's cheating. That's mine, too, because, you know, face huggers. Uh, yeah, that yeah. sucks. <laughs> he stole my answer, people. <laughs> Maybe that's why we get along yeah. so well. We have the same <laughs> irrational fears. <laughs> A face hug- I don't know that it's irrational to fear the face huggers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Totally legit- so That's totally legitimate. So, Christopher, uh, we have been going for an hour. The uh, button's about to pop and tell us that we are done with our show. But before we let you run away and write more words, because I understand Cheney's a slave driver, <laughs> can you tell listeners where they can find you? Yes, uh, they can find me personally at my website, ChristopherHopper.com. They can visit RuinsOfTheGalaxy.com for more from Jeff and I. And, uh, and there's also links there to some of the other Facebook groups as well. Outstanding. And of course, as always, dear listener, all links will be in the show notes below wherever you are listening to this amazing podcast. So, Chris, last question of the evening. How can listeners find us? Our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter handle is at SFS, that's Sierra Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. Our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. And our Facebook group is facebook.com slash groups slash SF shenanigans. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder and Seska Smalls, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was 
in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.